Now, our three basic pathways to compliance in the 2009 IECC, obviously. Number one, which is a very popular one, is prescriptive. And, of course, we use the R value tables, 402.11. The second method is what we call a U-factor or UA alternatives. And uh, these are used uh, in, in two basic areas. One is, let's say, for example, we're using SIPs panels um, or log homes or maybe advanced framing, where um, the R value of the material is really different than a conventional framed wall. So this allows us to take the U-factor into account because, say, for example, uh, when you look at a typical uh, framed wall uh, in a home or, or framing in a house, accounts for about 20% of its surface area. So to 25%. So let's say you have 25% framing. That means in a thousand feet of wall that's at R19, really about a thousand feet of that wall is about 4.35, which is the R value of a stud, and 75% uh, is at the R13. So the object behind the, having this alternative is to allow you to be a little bit more accurate and give you credit for uh, complying uh, as with a UA alternative. Uh, also, it allows you to do some trade-offs. Um, and when you're talking about uh, the U factor for the total building. Uh, so for example, uh, if you had a particular architectural design that didn't allow you to have an adequate enough insulation in your walls, you could offset that by more insulation in your ceiling or your floors. And then the third uh, mechanism uh, for compliance is what we call simulated performance. And this is where we have a reference design that meets the code and then your design or the builder's design is basically um, run through a software tool that determines uh, and simulates its performance to determine compliance. So with regards to the tools that we use to help us comply with the code, uh, to see if we're complying, uh, is number one, not prescriptive, there is none needed, we just simply read the chart, uh, but with the total building UA trade-off approach, uh, you would use a compliance tool like ResCheck software, which is either web-based or you could have it based on your desktop, which you can download uh, through one of the resources I'll tell you about later. And then uh, the other uh, third uh, compliance option uh, is energy analysis, and that's where uh, we're actually simulating the performance of that building with a computer. And what's neat about this software, it takes a lot of the things in the code into account in the software. So that, uh, and this software could be something like uh, a rim design or rim rate or energy gauge or a number of these software compliance tools out there. Uh, but they have to be uh, approved by the code official and uh, by the code. All right, so let's take, uh, have an overview of the mandatory compliance requirement. When we look at how the code is set up, uh, we certainly have some prescriptive requirements and we certainly have some requirements that are mandatory. Uh, and these mandatory requirements uh, are really important to follow. We have to follow these no matter what. So first of all, um, the mandatory requirements, when we look at climate zones, design conditions, materials and systems and equipment, those are three basic areas that mandatory requirements fall under. Uh, so when we look at uh, equipment, uh, identification, installation, for example, uh, there are certain requirements that we have to follow for that. First of all, let's talk about climate zones. Um, within the IECC, there are roughly eight climate zones. And Kentucky, all of Kentucky, falls into climate zone four. So that makes things pretty easy. So when we lower our chart, all we're looking for is uh, climate zone four. And as you can see here, that's that yellow band that runs through uh, the chart or the map of the United States here. Okay, so the first section we're gonna look at with regards to mandatory requirements are identification. It has to do with the materials and systems and equipment shall be identified in a manner that will allow determination of compliance uh, and if it's applicable with the division of the code. So what we want to be able to have is the code official go into a building to be able to look at the insulation, for example, and make sure that it's adequately identified or marked so he knows that it meets uh, the compliance for his particular geographic area. Um, one of the areas that we're looking at is that uh, this insulation certificate. And here, for example, this is one for an attic, and it says that it's been insulated, you know, to R, not really noted, but it's a blank certificate. But the building thermal envelope insulation, the insulation installer shall provide a certificate uh, listing the type of insulation, the manufacturer, and its R value. So with regard to, say, blowing insulation, for example, um, not only do you have to have that certificate, but you also have to have a depth marker every 300 square feet throughout the attic space to make sure that the insulation is at its proper depth. And you'll notice here, it actually has the inches and the R value of the insulation right on the marker. Okay. Uh, another uh, thing that's important, as I mentioned earlier, is that insulation materials themselves must be marked. So, for example, here you can see that the insulation is plainly marked and easy to read in terms of what the uh, manufacturer's R value is of that insulation. 
Now, we referred to windows before, but this is really important because it's an important part of an inspector's day-to-day -day routine of being able to identify whether or not windows have met the requirements in the code. And one of the ways to determine that is simply by looking at the NFRC label. Now, the NFRC label, uh, basically NFRC stands for the National Fenestrated Rating Council. It's an independent organization that basically uh, sets the standards for the energy ratings of windows so that we understand how those windows perform according to uh, some third-party uh, analysis and, and verification. So, for example, um, uh, windows have two labels on them. They have what they call the permanent label, which gives you some structural in information about the window, and that's typically a gold or a silver label that's in the frame of the window. Um, the NFRC label is what we call the temporary label, and it's required by code, and this label gives us some really important information. It's typically stuck to the window. Builders should always leave those labels on until after you've inspected. Uh, if you're a building inspector. And uh, two a very important piece of information that the code uh, is, is looking for. Number one, um, on the left-hand side here, we can see that we have what we call U-factor. Well, U-factor, again, is how conductive a window is to heat. So in other words, how much heat is transmitted uh, through a square foot of glass in this case. So this window transmits 0.35 BTUs of energy per square foot of surface area per degree of temperature difference between indoors and outdoors. That sounds complicated, but it's basically uh, really how that window is going to perform at reducing uh, heat being conducted from the house to the outdoors or from the air, hot air outside, in through the glass to the indoors. Now, the other most, another very important part of this label is the solar heat gain coefficient. That has to do with how much radiant heat from the sun comes through the glass. So for example, in this window, this window allows 32% of the sun's radiant energy to get through that glass. Now you might recall, we recognize that in Kentucky that 40-45% um, you know, of your design cooling load can be solar gains through glass. So it's really important to have windows that have low solar heat gain coefficients to reject that heat from the sun. So this window, for example, rejects 68% of the sun's radiant heat energy. And again, this is required to have an NFRC label. Now, there are a few exceptions, uh, but in general, we want to see that NFRC label on, on windows and know that the windows meet what's how the house was modeled. OK, so with regards to mandatory requirements, um, a certificate is mandatory. Um, air leakage uh, control is mandatory, in other words, sealing homes. Controls, such as thermostats, are mandatory. Duct sealing is mandatory. Uh, mechanical uh, system piping insulation, say for hydronic systems, is mandatory, as well as circulating hot water systems you have to have uh, pipe insulation. There also is a mandatory requirement for mechanical ventilation. Also, equipment sizing is mandatory. What does that mean? That basically refers to uh, making sure that our heating and cooling systems are sized appropriately using the Air Conditioning Contractors of Association uh, algorithms to determine the size of the system. Systems like, for example, air conditioning systems tend to be oversized. What happens is uh, the air conditioning is oversized, it short cycles because it can cool the house down really quickly, but doesn't run long enough to dehumidify the air. So the house feels cold and clammy. So the code says, hey, wait a minute, buildings can be a lot more energy efficient, customers can be a lot more com comfortable if these systems are sized and designed right. So that's why there's a mandatory requirement for equipment size. We'll talk more about that later. Also, systems serving uh, multiple dwelling units are mandatory. Uh, Snowmelt controls are mandatory. Now, snowmelt systems are not required by the Kentucky Residential Code. However, if a snowmelt system is installed, then compliance with the snowmelt system controls covered in Section 403.8 of the IECC is required. Also, some pool covers are mandatory. There are also mandatory requirements for lighting and lamps. Specifically, the 2009 IECC requires at least 50% of the permanently installed lighting fixtures to have high efficacy lamps installed. So what is a high efficacy lamp? We saw in chapter two that these lamps are defined as any lamps with a minimum efficacy rating of at least 60 lumens per watt for any lamp over 40 watts. Then the lamp shall provide at least 50 lumens per watt for lamps over 15 watts up to and including 40 watts. And finally, at least 40 lumens per watt for any lamps that are 15 watts or less. High efficacy lamps are typically light emitting diodes or LEDs, compact fluorescent lamps or CFLs, 
T8 or smaller diameter linear fluorescent lamps or any lamp meeting the code lumen per watt requirements. Lumens, in simple terms, means the amount of light produced by a lamp or a bulb. Watts is a measure of the amount of electricity consumed to produce that light. So more lumens means brighter light. But to meet the energy code requirements, look for lumens that are produced by lower wattage lamps. All right, so let's talk about in general. Well, first of all, a certificate. Every home has to have a certificate, and that needs to be permanently mounted to the electrical distribution panel. It can't cover or obstruct any other required labels. Uh, it must be completed by the builder or registered design professional. Uh, the list uh, basically has uh, predominant R values, new values. It lists the types of efficiencies of heating and cooling equipment, as well as water heater, uh, hot water heating equipment. Uh, it specifies whether it's a gas-fired or unvented room heater, electric furnace, or baseboard electric heater, if these are installed. So basically, these are the things we want to see on that certificate. That helps the code inspector, uh, the field inspector, know that this building's up to par. And here's an example of what uh, one of these certificates looks like for, for Kentucky. And you'll notice at the top here, the compliance method was prescriptive. And then you've got the R values there. And so all the inspector has to do is look at his 402.1 chart and then look at the certificate. And he can see whether the insulation in the ceiling, the walls, the floors, the roof meets the standard. And also tells the type of HVAC equipment. It also gives you the U factor and, uh, of windows and doors as well as some other important information.